he had told us this story about how he doesn't wear shoes on set. Like, so any, any movie you've ever seen Sean Penn in, he's not wearing shoes. Live from the Willie Nelson and Friends Museum Showcase in Nashville, Tennessee, it's Music is Funny. Musicians talking to comedians about music and comedy with your hosts, Raylan Nelson and Jonathan Bright. Welcome back to Music is Funny. I'm Raylan Nelson. And I'm Jonathan Bright from the Raylan Nelson Band. I'm practicing my ASMR voice. What do you think? I don't even know what ASMR is. A Sean Patton. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How's it going? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. This is my co-host and music partner, Jonathan Bright, but we all call him JB. Hey, man. Hi, JB. Nice to meet you. How do I sound? Sound fantastic. Sound great. All right. You can't hear this air conditioner? Nope. Nope. All right. (laughs) Fucking nailed it. I like how you have your ring light behind you and turned off. (laughs) <laughs> it's a pretty good look for the <laughs> for a zoom call to have it behind you and turn i got well i've got another one in front of me <laughs> but i trust you I've, but it's funny I've, I've got it aimed at the wall so it doesn't like turn my eye you know how ring lights turn your eyes into like alien like crazy eyes eye? yeah it's like, I, I aimed it at the wall so it bounces back on me and just looks like a listen to me Acting like I know what the fuck I'm talking about. It looks great. You did good. You're a you're a light professional. Ray Lynn is an you're obs- hired. She's obsessed with ring lights anyway. Yeah, I am. I have I would have thirty seven of them if I could. You know what? And that's a good number because it's a prime number, something I'm obsessed with. So You're obsessed with prime numbers? I, yeah. Or the number thirty seven, because I'm also obsessed with the number thirty seven. <laughs> Wait, what is it about the number thirty seven? I don't know. I see it everywhere. Do you? Yeah, I don't know. Do you have an explanation and explanation? You're not. Are you 37 years old? No. Um, no, are I'm actually. Th- I identify as a 27 year old. Biologically, exactly. That's all. <laughs> Biologically speaking, though. Uh, yeah, you know, but I I was born in 1984, but I I do identify as a 27 year old. But listen, so since I was born in 1984, and apparently you're really good at math, you do know that I'm 37, and but but. I, I just turned 37 and I've seen the number 37 everywhere. Hi, how's it going? We have patrons in the museum around here. So um, this is Sean Patton. He says, hi. Hi. Are you taking a picture? Um, Hi, hi, patrons. (laughs) uh, Where were we? What were we saying? 37. I feel like we were on a good conversation. 37. I've seen the number 37 37 for like 10 years now. It's been about 10 years. I've seen it everywhere. Random spots. I mean, num- numerology is it's it's up there with like uh, astro or astro is it astrology astronomy? It's up there with astronomy, like or or like if, astrology. If, yeah, astrology is it astrology? Which is this kind of the same thing as astronomy because I, I think, think so. it's all about space, right? Uh, kind of. I, str- I mean, astrology more, comes from the stars. That's I think astrology is more hippie, and astronomy is more <laughs> NASA. That's Which true. one is more zodiac sign? Astrology. That's astrology. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Um, it's like that. It's like if you want to believe in it, you could, and like religion, really, too. If you want to believe in it, you could find tons of meaning. And good, good goodness is there so much shit going on with numerology. But yeah, 37, it's a prime number. Um, it's one of uh, millions of prime numbers. But there, I, I don't know anything off the top of my head special about it. But if you see it everywhere, it's your number. So yeah. this year, if you turn 37, this is your golden year. There you well, go. Okay. Maybe that's what it is. I always thought it meant I was on the right path or something, you know, like but you're doing sure. good. You're doing good kid or something, you know, <laughs> I was actually 27. If that's the case. My lucky number is like at 99. Cause wouldn't that guarantee I would live at least that long to have my golden year? Yeah. I wish I would have had a longer. Yeah. Yeah. Your life's shit after 37. I mean, <laughs> Now, JB, have you turned 99 yet? I can't tell. I'm there. on my way. I'm closer <laughs> yeah. than Ray Lynn is. Oh, yeah. He loves to tell everybody how old he is on this podcast. How old are you, JB? No, she gives me shit because we'll talk to older comedians who of my vintage, and they'll reference something of that time, and I'll just make – we've never met. So I just say, hey, I am roughly the same age as you. It's every We podcast. have the same references. It's every podcast. Yeah, well, maybe we talk to a lot of old people. 
Well, you know, um, so really quickly, uh, there's a bar in Austin, Texas called yeah. Mug Shots, right? Um, I turned 40 a couple of years ago in Austin. Uh, and, and Austin, Texas is the 40 year old uh, white dude of cities. <laughs> where it's just like, oh, I'm, I'm still living it up, man. I ain't no, I ain't 40. 40 is a number. But on the, on the side of that bar, and there is a mural of your grandfather of uh, Willie Nelson himself. Just, and I was looking for the picture of myself that I took underneath him posed in that exact same sort of chill. Deme- I can, I can't find it. I'm just, it, so I'm verbally telling you about it. Is but it yeah, his uh, mugshot that's there? It is, it is not his mugshot. It's him like arms folded with the, uh, the bandana and the braids. Look, it's bad. It's a badass mural. It has nothing. It doesn't. It's not his mugshot though. Unless they let him take a mugshot once. Like <laughs> he's got the most badass <laughs> mugshot of them all. Yeah, a mean mugshot, you know. But uh, no, it's on the side of the bar in Austin on Seventh Seventh Street and then Red River. Yeah. And that is an awesome bar. It's where I turned forty while playing Big Buck Hunter, which for some reason is huge in the cities, but. No one ever, no one playing those those games would ever actually shoot a deer. <laughs> Isn't it weird the difference between your 40th birthday party and your 21st birthday party? Because you probably didn't throw yeah. your shoes at 40. No, I, I don't. I don't even. I think my 21st birthday party. I mean, I'm from New Orleans. Well, you so say, like, you're like German. You started drinking very, very young then. Uh, yeah. First first drink was a Coors Light when I was like 14. Yeah. You know? And they start you with light beer. But uh, so like my 21st birthday was sort of like an old hat where you're like, oh, oh good. I can finally do this legally. Right. Cool. <laughs> but yeah, 40 was like, I'm still doing it. See, guys, I'll drink all night, whatever. What do you got? Cocaine? I, that you're trying to prove something to everyone else except yourself where, you, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's, I do believe it's all bullshit and aging. It's all in your head. Like if no one ever told you your age, you just sort of live until right. you died, you know? But I also feel like there is sort of this pressure where you're like, uh, no, I'm cool. Look, see, I'm still awesome. It's like, that. Hey, just be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Well, you mentioned New Orleans. We always start with this question. Oh, yeah. What's the first music you remember loving? So I grew up hardcore on Neil Young. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that, that was my, that was my, my parents blessed me my parents had this like four way. It was Neil Young, great, Jimmy Buffett, uh, uh, Jackson Brown, ah, better, and then the Eagles. Uh, ah, it depends on where you stand. And that was like in the rotation every time I got into a car with my parents. It was one of those four bands, and Neil Young was the one I remember just loving the album Harvest Moon. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, that was what they came out. That was his more, that was some of his more acoustic stuff. But uh, that was, that was the first, there's a song called King about his dead dog. Yeah. And that was like the first song I remember like knowing, just knowing off the top of my head, just knowing when it came on, loving it, singing it to myself as a kid, you know, eight years old, eight, nine years old. Yeah. So maybe, you- maybe even older. So when you get out of that and you hit your teenage years, I know at least, at least me, we you all start kind of rebelling against the first thing you started listening to. How, how, where did you go from there? You know, when you get into high school, because high school is who you're at least around here, the bands you liked, you know, you had to make a statement, you know, people, you were judged harshly in junior high and high school on your musical tastes. Yeah. I mean, the first, the first tape, the first tape I ever bought, because that's what we bought back then, was cassette. You remember buying cassettes? They would it would be like the cassette, and then it would come in this big plastic like. Oh yeah, this is probably more for JB than it is for you, Ray. <laughs> <But, laughs> what is this cassette thing cassettes. you talk about? I remember cassettes. But that big thing that would make them stick up in the record, like when you're going through the yeah, record. yeah, like the like yeah, the handle almost. Um, my first tape I ever bought was the Public Enemy, Apocalypse '91. So I went like oh. from like Neil Young and uh, Jackson, you know, right, right into like hip hop. And like, luckily it was good hip hop, but then, you know, it got, it got, we all went through a color me bad phase. (laughs) We all right. (laughs) New new kids on the block. Yeah. Yeah. I think mine looking back almost, I've said this before, 
Kiss when I was nine years old is my first favorite band. And kind of looking back on it now and listening to some of the songs stuff, you know, nostalgia and everything, but I'm like, yeah, it was kind of a boy band targeted towards nine-year-old little boys. You know what's interesting is how interesting that actually, how true that actually is. Because I was not, I was, I was coming up in like the 90s. Right. We, you know, I was behind the time for Kiss, but I, we, I still had friends who were like Kiss, Kiss people. And I remember the first time actually hearing Kiss being like, wait, this is Kiss? Because I had heard like Megadeth and uh, yeah. you know, Anthrax and like even like harder, like Deicide and Cannibal Corpse and all this. And like Kiss looked like they were the father of all of that. Yeah. And then yeah. you listen to Kiss and you're like, oh, this is, wow, this is way catchier and uh-huh. um, like mom friendly than I thought it was going to be. It's funny you should say that because I remember my parents, I would have to get money from them or work errands to get the records and they'd see the fucking fire and the demon and the tongue and that shit all on the album cover then when i'd put the record on my mom would go this, this sounds like kind of 50s bebop music sometimes i'm like oh, shut up mom yeah. shut you know, up this is, this is rebellion and it's I'm funny. rebelling against you in this comfortable shut environment that you have provided for me <laughs> yeah, yeah the standard you don't get me you don't fucking know me <laughs> you know my mom, yesterday, my mom, mom asked what I wanted to be when I grow up, and I said I wanted to be a performer, and she's like, well, you should consider going to a liberal arts college. Fuck you, bitch. You don't fucking know me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 that phase we all go through, our poor moms. So were you into comedy at all in your teenage years? I was. I just didn't know it. Like, I wasn't uh, – I, you know, you talk to some comics who sort of get like a comedy education when they're young, like they're, they're watching Seinfeld and shit when they're growing up and, or like all in the family. My, my parents uh, made enough money to like pay for cable, but because they paid for cable, all we were allowed to watch was cable. It was a very <laughs> weird dynamic looking back. None of that free shit. Dude, I swear to you, like if 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 they walked in and we were watching for some reason, like ABC or some, you know, they'd be like, what are you doing? What are you this? Look, the Nickelodeon, you got HBO. You got, and they just <laughs> my mom would like flip through the channels for us to find some to find like a film, a movie, like to go to Cinemax, go to I mean, never anything raunchy, but like right. they definitely pushed us hard to watch the cable that they were paying for because they both. You know, they're working class, they're working class people. They paid for that, you know? And so I grew up watching a lot of films, but I never really was, you know, I wasn't really given like a comedy education as a kid. And then when I was in high school, grounded, because I was a bad kid, uh, (laughs) Mr. Show with Bob and David came on HBO in real time. And I I watched that like in real time. So like, I remember like, I, I caught it like the night it premiered, just coincidentally. And that changed my life. That changed my, I was like, this is the kind of stuff I think is funny. And then like from there, I went back and watched like kids in the hall and then uh, the state and, you know, and then found like an old, my dad had a pretty decent vinyl collection before vinyl collections were a thing. Um, And I found an old uh, Richard Pryor album that I I can't say the title of on uh, ever. That that Uh, guy is crazy. Yeah, yeah, that that person's out of their mind. Uh, and <laughs> I remember like listening to it and then my dad not catching me listening to it. But like, you know, I was like 15 at the time. So I wasn't like a sh- I was like, oh, no, but I was listening to it. And he was like, oh, yeah, this because to him, that was Richard Pryor. It didn't matter what he was talking about to him. It was like, this is a classic comedy album. Yeah, you go ahead and listen to this. I wish I could have had this when I was your age, you know, because he got it when he was in his 20s. So like. Then I started going back and like seeing and listening to great comedy. And then it was like my late teens when I saw, you remember the Larry Sanders show? It's one of my favorite shows. I just went back and binged it during the pandemic. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. So there's an episode with Sarah Silverman. Well, there's like a season with Sarah Silverman. Oh yeah. But but there's an episode. She's essentially playing herself, right? Uh-huh. Like a comedian who gets a writer on a date, and there's an and there's an episode where she does a set, like a, a stand up set on his show, and I remember what. And then this was like, of course, I was watching it after the fact. It was like a rerun. This was in 1999, but I remember watching that and being like, I, "I'm going to do it. I'm going to do comedy." 
for something about it, I was just like, I identify with this moment, with this character, with her, with her. I don't know why. I just, I still to this day can't tell you exactly what it was other than as I was watching her perform a stand-up set on a TV show. I was like, that is what it is. That is what I want. That is, I've told her that. I've told Sarah Silverman that, and she's just like, thanks. You know, I'm like, you're you're welcome. And then walked away almost (laughs) weeping that I got to say that to her. Yeah, I wonder if that's because you just watch some of that show and you you see that character just working a gig and then working their way up and like, oh, there's a pathway to go do something. Like, I can see where it would plant a seed. Well, I mean, like, I always knew I wanted to do something. And young, really young, I, I think, I, it started with music, but I have zero, zero musical talent. Like, I, 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 I can play drums a little bit. I'm tone deaf. I'm just completely fucking tone deaf. I can't. I took guitar lessons. I remember the tuning exercises. I would be like, I don't, this all sounds the exact same to me. You know, like me strumming my guitar and other students be like, dude, that's really out of tune. I'm like, you're out of tune. Shut up. I'm like, I don't, I can't play guitar. I can't sing, but I could perform. So like, it just, but I didn't know where that would fit until pretty much that moment. And then a couple, then it took me a couple of years to build up the courage to actually do it, you know? So what when, about acting? I'm yeah, sorry. I was just about to, did you want, did you ever consider acting since you knew you wanted to perform in some way? Yeah, I wish this is, this is a, yes, I did. And this is a thing that sucks about growing up in the South, certain parts of the South, because look, New Orleans is a fantastic city, but New Orleans, there's no real, like, I feel like I, sometimes I get jealous of kids who grew up in like a major city where there is access Yeah. to like, for kids where it's like when you're, when you're 13 and you're in the back, you're like in your, like I would take like 45 minute showers where I'm like basically acting out scenes and like, you know, (laughs) performing. And my, my, you know, my parents like, what the fuck are you doing in there? Stop. If you're going to, if you're going to play with yourself, you know, wait, don't waste water doing it. You know, like that kind of shit. And, but there was no, even like in high school, like I went Louisiana public, the Louisiana public education system can suck my dick. It's terrible. It's a <laughs> terrible public school system. They need to fix it. I'm sure Louisiana is not the only state, but I had some of the saddest, most weak, just weakest guidance counselors you could fucking think of where like they just, there was no encouragement to do anything, but like go to class and get good grades. And it's like, I feel like I was acting out. I was lashing out. I was being a performer. That's why I got in so much trouble as a kid. And never once was anyone like, Oh, what about, and I know I'm not, I'm putting a lot on them, but I didn't know how to verbalize it either. And there was no, you know, where it's like in a New York or LA or Chicago or probably even in Nashville. I mean, I mean, I mean, I've been in Nashville many times. I love it. And one of the things I love the most about it is if you go to just like a random karaoke night, I've done this so many times as a comedian where you end up, we ended up at that, um, what's that place called where it's like the trailer? It's a karaoke bar. Santa's Pub. Pub. Yes. We've gone there as comedians, like, let's go do some karaoke. We're wasted and we'll be funny. And everyone is amazing. Yeah. Every single person gets up there and you end up, you end up just watching a show. Yeah, you know, like every time I've been there, I'm like, this is a show. I'm watching the next performer. Oh, my God, they're going to do Dolly Parton. They're going to kill it. Oh, my God, they're going to do Rage Against the Machine. They're going to kill it. They're going to do, uh, you know, uh, Jewel. They're gonna, everyone's going to murder it. And, and, and I just wish there was more of like a, in, in New Orleans anyway, more of like a, or coming up, there was more of like a, hey, if you want to be a performer, you can do that too. But uh, I do act now and I do have, you know, I'm, I've sold a pilot. I'm like working on getting cool. that up and running now. I mean, that's still a process. Yeah. Um, working on getting that up and running now, like acting is great, but I guess I also feel like, uh, once you actually, you know, acting is a lot of stop, go, wait, hurry up. It's a very meticulous process. Whereas like, the performance part is all I care about. And that's, I guess that's what drew me to stand up over it. You know what I mean? Cause there was no stand up comedy scene in new Orleans too. You kind of had to, I had to dig that out and find it and be like, ah, here's this small little group. And then 
from there moved to, you know, a bigger city. So I feel like I'm just rambling now. I apologize. No, it's good. It's yeah. good. So that small little group you talk about, was there a comedy club there when you were starting out or was it just doing pop-up shows basically? Pop-up shows. They're still, they're still not a club. They're, they're, I don't know that there'll ever be a le- like a legit comedy club in New Orleans, but there is now a legit comedy scene. Ah, you know, a few of you guys have come out of there recently. You know, yeah. Theo and Mark, Mark Norman. Norman and, 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 yeah, so I'm yeah, sure. Theo. Oh That's yeah, forget this. Theo lives. Theo lives in uh, Nashville now. He does. Yeah. He's he one does. of the few that skipped Austin and just kept coming, and you know, made it to Nashville. Yeah, Theo's a, Theo. Uh, Theo and I are from the. We're both from the North shore of, uh, of New Orleans, which is like across the lake, which is like the, the like Staten Island right. of, of New Orleans. You know, like I wouldn't call us, I wouldn't call us white trash, but we're more like white recyclable. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, how do you, you started doing stand up in New Orleans? How did you get out and where did you go to first after New Orleans? Like what, what took you out of there? I mean, at a certain point, in any smaller scene like that, you know, without a legit club, you realize you got to go, you know, you're like, I got it, figure it out. I got to get the fuck out of here. And spiritually, I wanted to go to New York, but I thought I had to go to LA. So I went to LA first and spent a year in LA and like, liked it, you know, it was got, got into it, but just wasn't a hundred percent. It just didn't feel a hundred percent like the place I needed to be at that time. So then this random last minute opportunity to move to New York for very cheaply presented itself. And like, I'm not, I'm not a fate guy or a religious guy, but I do believe sometime in like cosmic opportunity, it presents itself. And it just felt like, yeah, this is it. Move to New York city for four. It was a it was to live somewhere for $425 uh, all in a month. Jesus, I know. I was like, this, that's insane. So I sold my car, which it was a Saturn. It went fast, went way faster than I was expecting. (laughs) And with that money, just jumped to the next coast. And when I got to, and I was kind of expecting this, but it was very fun to finally get to my $425 bedroom, only to discover it wasn't a bedroom at all. It was a fucking cubicle. That's the best way to describe it. It was like a wall that didn't go all the way to the ceiling or hit the floor. It was a cubicle. Wow. Um, Um, But it was... $425 $425 a month, even no, that's it all in and been Bushwick, Brooklyn. And, uh, then I moved here and have never looked back. I like LA. I got nothing against LA. I have fun in LA, my girlfriend's from LA. So technically I spend time with her family and see a different side of LA every time I go, but I just will never feel about it. Like I feel about New York. I love it. New York. So when you moved there, did you have buddies that were there that had, uh, you know, in the comedy scene or did you step in kind of blind and have to work your way up through there? No, both times was blind. It just was totally like, fuck it. Let's just, I mean, like I knew, I knew when I got to LA, I knew a couple of people just from like, you know, online stuff. And then by the time I, from, so by the time I got here, I knew a couple of people through like, you know, proximity or not proximity, but you know, what's the word when you know someone through someone else? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, no. I can't think of the word. Why but, can't I think? Like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon? <laughs> yes, <laughs> pretty much. Kevin. That's what, yeah. that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I knew, I knew a couple of people through the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon style. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And then I got here and was like, you know, fuck it. Let's do it all over again. But it was, fu- it was, there was something sort of, you ever, you ever, did you, did you know that back to the future? When they originally shot that movie, it was starring Eric Stoltz. No. This is true. Back to the Future was originally starring Eric Stoltz, and about six weeks in, they realized it wasn't working, and they recast Michael J. They, cast, they fired him and cast Michael J. Fox, and then it was working, and then it became a classic movie. That's kind of how New York and L.A. were for me. We're like L.A. was like the Eric Stoltz version. Where it was like, this doesn't feel right. And I just recast Cities and was like, aha! Found it because I was doing that because I was starting all over again. It just there was almost like a natural sort of ease with it all. Like I was like, no, I know what to do. I've done this once in a major scene. Now I'm going to go and do it again in New York. I I know just show up at the open mics, just do them no matter how shitty they are. God, 
damn it, were they fucking awful. <laughs> but what was very interesting for, for me is when my, girl, my girlfriend's a musician. She's, a, she's like a musical com- comedian. But at first, she would go to a lot of musical open mics here. Then this was only a few years ago, or like five years ago. And I would go with her to some of these musical open mics. And they, it was like, man, open mics are just by nature god awful shitty uh-huh oh yeah because yeah, nobody's sucks. paying attention nobody's there to see the music or the comedy they're there to do the music or the comedy so your audience is a bunch of jaded fucks out there going yeah. oh, i could probably do better than that or working on their own shit while you're doing your stuff or like the thing and the thing that always drove me crazy about it was like the the nutty the, some like sometimes you get that, i'm sure this happens in music too you get that one mic that's like amazing where for some reason the whoever's running it has cracked the code like the venue's great the vibe is awesome everybody wants to be there every week everyone's for some reason just way more into each other's sets and there's a great time and there's great energy and you're like we can do this we're all gonna fucking succeed oh god we're in this together and then you'll see those same exact people two nights later at a different mic and everyone's just a fucking dickhead and you're like what happened (laughs) <laughs> what happened to two nights ago when we were all on the frontier of artistic discovery together and now we're all pretending like we don't know each other? Like, what's happening here? But that's that's why I say to any young performer, like, just knuckle up and punch through that. You got to do it. It's the worst part, but it's also the best part when you get past it. And you look back and you go, ha fuck y'all. I'm still doing it. And it prepares you for any of that shit that will rear its ugly head on down the line because mm-hmm. not necessarily bombing but you know when you bomb or you play to nobody and you have to fight your way through that you're pretty much prepared for anything that even when you get more successful this some shit happens you're more prepared for it because you've been through it well are, are you both jb are you a musician as well yeah yeah he's my guitar player and music partner we write the songs and oh awesome awesome the band. so i gotta ask like as i'm sure everyone asked this question but like as the daughter of a legend or the granddaughter of a legend, when you go into music, do you feel there's like extra? Oh yeah. Oh my God. They're all judging and expecting it to be, uh, you know, just as amazing as my grandpa, of course, or to, I always say, you know, we don't do the same kind of music, you know, and we don't, uh, I'm not as good of a player as my grandpa or as good of a songwriter necessarily, but maybe one day. Uh, but, I'm about to say yet. You don't know that yet. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that yet. But I think that it comes from the same spot because I wanted to do this because I saw him doing it, mm-hmm. and I do feel like songs come to me naturally, and I'm I bring good melodies to the table. I think that's my strong suit. So. Yeah, and like we talked about, I mean, just the name will open some doors, but it doesn't give you any no. leg up because once that door is open, you're judged twice as harsh, you know, and yeah. it's like, you're no fucking Willie Nelson. It's like, yeah, there's really only one of those, you know, that <laughs> you could say right. that about pretty much everybody else playing music, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you'll get the same feeling as when you go see my grandpa play, but, uh, that's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, like you, that, that's, and like, that's such a crazy thing too, of like how you're, it's one of those things where it's like, no one else would watch a band and be like, huh, but this is no Willie Nelson. If, and if they didn't know, They'd probably be like, God, this is great. And then you're like, that's Willie Nelson's granddaughter. Like, wait a second. You know, it's like, why, why get judgmental? There's a, cause there's a comic out here named Jordan Rock, who is Chris Rock's younger brother. Okay. Oh, oh, like, man. Yeah, so exactly. Him. We got to get him on. We got to yeah. get him on. I feel like him. Jordan, like, yeah. Absolutely. Got to get Jordan on. Jordan's a super cool kid. And he's very funny. And you can tell he just walks around like hoping people don't put two and two together. Yeah. Even though it's, hard to do that with the last name rock in comedy you know yeah, yeah. i you know i'm proud of my grandpa and like he said it p- most most people will listen to the songs because of it being me my grandpa being willie nelson but it doesn't mean they're gonna like it so you know it's it's a blessing and a curse I guess. yeah i mean i imagine it's also like uh do, do you have any other siblings in music Yes. Um, well, they're not siblings. My uncle Lucas is Papa Willie's son. So it's my dad's younger brother, okay. Lucas. He actually, um, his band was Neil Young's backing band. Oh, wow. For a while. Still okay. does whenever. Oh, still when they have a full band, I think they still do it. Yeah. And they still do it. And they're Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real. And he's had a really good 
success. I, I mean, he's had a really good career. He's successful. Yeah. He's doing it. Um, Micah Nelson, his younger brother too, okay. is also his particle kid, and he's been open for the Flaming Lips. This I know, I know who that is. Yeah, that's. Yeah, he's in LA based, okay. so you might know a little bit of that. Um, and then my aunt Amy, she has a band called Folk Uke with Kathy Guthrie, who is Arlo Guthrie's. Oh wow! Daughter. Yeah, yeah, hilarious. And yeah, you, it's kind of um, musical comedy. I bet uh, you and your girlfriend would get a kick out of that. You got to look up folk uke. And then my aunt, my aunt Paula, she has a band also and she's starting to perform again, but I think she mostly just does her radio show on Sirius where she she has her own radio show, Paula Nelson. So yeah, we, and there's other siblings, but those are the ones that are out there. Do you know, in the, it's all the siblings that you know about that are playing music. Oh, that's true. There, there that might be, be some that we don't know about because, you know, my grandpa is a rock star. And, um, yeah, exactly. Spread, to... spread the seed. Yes, yes. Exactly. Like the good, good Lord told him to do. <laughs> <laughs> the good Lord said, Willie, get out there and spread it. Be, be spread fruitful it. and multiply, I think is the right. terminology. So as you started coming up in New York, man, how did you like, who are some of the comics that were, uh, you know, the class or, you know, slightly above you that you met that we've, we've talking to a bunch of comics. There's always a few people that help, help you along that are further along than you. I mean, that, that was what was so interesting about that. time. Like, so when Raylan first asked me to do this, the thing that really you said in, you were talking about how music and it was something in the pitch or the, just the, the initial in, uh, when you reached out, when you were like music and comedy, we talk about how they're similar, similar. Yeah. And I feel like the similarities, especially now are that it's all niche market, basically. Yeah. Like the idea of like rock star, or like superstar, or like is, is, is all contained within like, I don't think there's going to be any more arena comedians. I think we've kind of seen the end of that. I think you'll get, still get, you know, comedians that sell out theaters and some comedians that sell out, you know, uh, venues, obviously. But I think, like, it's all becoming so niche because there are comedians who, by my standards, are absolute, are super, are famous. They're sell, they sell 50 to 100,000 tickets a year. They, they you know in comedy circles, they walk around like gods. They're famous, but your average Joe has no clue who they are. Right. Yeah. And like that, in my opinion, in, in my eyes happened to music somewhere in the late nineties. And I know it was happening way before that, but you know, you look at the nineties and everybody always thinks about, you know, uh, the Pearl jams and the Nirvana's and the Allison chains and all these big bands and the grunge era. But what about the guided by voices, you know, and the, clutch and all these other bands that were just sort of like existing in the background, making a living, selling out shows, but not selling out a thousand seaters, selling out, you know, 200 to 500 seaters. And it's like, and they still exist to this day. And I think that's what's happening with comedy now where it used to be about like, you, you know, you got on Letterman, you got on, Conan, you did that a couple of times. You shot to stardom. You you got an hour on Comedy Central. You got a TV show. I know comedians who have multiple hours on Comedy Central and have been on TV and in shows and had their own shows even that most people have never heard of. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's crazy because like you look at my credits. I ha and if you look at my credits, I think I'm low on the credit totem pole compared to some of my colleagues. But if you had my credits back in the late '90s before I started doing stand up, you would technically be a famous comedian. Uh -huh. Whereas now it makes you a working comedian. You know, mm -hmm. which is great. You know, getting to do this what I love for a living, and I love it. I'm I'm grateful beyond grateful. I love it beyond love itself. It's my favorite thing, you know, but it's all niche now. And I think that that is a thing that comedy and music really have in common now yeah. it is that like, it's all just about to you to your fan base. Don't, you know, there was this theory, I think, you know, when I first started comedy, that was like, you have to be able to kill it in any room. And now I don't think that applies. Now I think it's more like you have to be able to kill it in any room that your fans are willing to come to. Yeah. But yeah. you, you know, you kind of play for your fan base now and you build your fan base. And like, so when I'm, 
I, and I, and this goes to your, to your question, JB, is that when I moved to New York, one of the first comedians I ever saw live that I didn't, that blew my head in half was Bill Burr. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We love Bill. And, and this was in 2008. I, uh, I go to this comedy club that's now defunct called Comics, but it was a ama- it was a great club in the uh, meatpacking district. And I go and meet a couple other guys, and Bill Burr is the headliner of this show. And I'd never seen him live; I'd only kind of heard his name. But one of the other guys was like, "No, no, 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 stay and watch this." And I remember the moment he was like, "All right, folks, I gotta go." In my heart, being like, "No, stay up there forever!" Like he was. It was my, it just it, it it blew my mind, then reassembled it, then blew it again, then like scraped all the unhappiness out, then reformed it for a third time. And I was like, a, I swear to God, I was a happier person for the next three days because I loved his set yeah. so much. And it inspired me that like, hey, sometimes it's about being true to yourself as the artist and not giving a shit what the audience thinks. And in that action, the audience will be like, well, wait a second. He clearly doesn't give a shit what we think. So we should be listening to what he's saying. <gasps> oh, my God. That's yeah. brilliant. We should trust you always. And that's what Bill does. Yeah. That's the thing that Bill is great at. He does not pander. He is not trying to win you over. He is not trying to crowd please. He is being Bill Burr. And sometimes it, it, people are like, whoa. But if they just hang on for that extra three or four seconds, like, oh, you're ah, that's hilarious. And getting to meet him and how nice he was and how friendly he was and how willing to talk about comedy he was early on. That was that really, really shaped a lot of the way I do things now. Yeah. Um, I would ne- and I would never say any of this to Bill Burr. Ever. <laughs> I'd be terrified to tell him all this. I'm afraid he would just fucking stare me down and I'd melt under that gaze. But like, I'll tell he, him you said it. No, okay, please do. <laughs> it's better if it comes from a third person. <laughs> I actually got to see him at the comedy store in the main room, but I, I just saw the last two minutes of his, you know, it was probably like maybe five minutes, but still it was like, I felt like that. I was like, no, I didn't get long enough with you. But of course I did only get the, hear the last few minutes of it. Right. He's, and did you, did you talk to him? No, I'm just kidding. I don't know him at all. I'm, I can't tell him what you said about him if I want, or maybe, maybe I just manifested that into happening. <laughs> I bet, I bet he would so be willing to fucking to sit down and talk to you. I did email him and ask him if he would drum on our last single we put out and he didn't respond. No response. Can you believe that? No response. <sighs> Crazy. I mean, also he's. I also I feel like he's at the he's at that level where he's got someone else reading his emails. I have a feeling, and he's oh, also yeah. got a lot of things going on. I, I would should imagine. just email them again. Then. Yeah, he didn't say no. That's our whole thing with reaching out to you, to you guys. guys. Yeah. If we as long as they don't say no, we keep reaching out. The first no you get, we're like, all right, we're not going to hassle you. <laughs> like we've only had like three hard no's. Yeah. Do you guys? I mean, how do you feel about? Because I know Nashville. I think Nashville is like where the the head the the headquarters of like the music industry now. Pretty well, much, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it's cheaper than Los Angeles and New York, so everybody that used to stay. I mean, there's still pockets in both of those, but a lot of people have moved here. Major studio, like recording studios and stuff. Yeah, people come here for sure. And even production, TV production, and it's starting to creep in. Yeah, movie stuff. Yeah, from LA, it seems to be. I think I our taxes like, are a little better. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, definitely. I remember in like 2017, I was in Nashville doing the, it was then called the Wild West Comedy Fest. I think it's just called the Nashville Comedy Fest now. But myself and like three other comics, four other comics, we recorded an album at Third Man Records. Oh, nice. Right? It was, well, it was Ari Shafir. Do you know Ari? Oh, we had him on here. Oh, yeah. So Ari was, we did his storytelling show live. And it was recorded as like a one-time album. There, I think they pressed it on a vinyl. I don't know. Um, Dude, by the way, your your cumin story hysterical. Oh, thank you, thank you. People bring me jars of cumin to sign. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I have signed oh. many. It has, last week when I was in record, I just recorded another album last week in Portland. People brought me jars of cumin to, to, I was like, I should have a brand of cumin. 
You yeah, should. you should. I'll, Why I'll not? This shit. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody's I, I, listening to this that hasn't heard that story, go Google it. And uh, it was, what, this is not happening. And then side uh, trail from what we were just talking about. What is the weirdest thing you've signed other than cumin? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, this, I mean, this was a, I don't know if this was a move. Someone was busting on me, but it, it was a, a prescription for birth control. <laughs> <laughs> now that person's funny. I thought exactly. I thought that was slick as hell, but and it was years ago. But she was like, "Can I have your autograph?" And I was like, "You want to just take a picture?" She's like, "No, I want your autograph." And I was like, "All right, old school." And she just slapped, and I didn't realize it until I was signing it. I was like, "Oh my god, am I being? Is this a move? Am I being flirted with? We're being punked? I can't tell." So I just kind of like gave it back to her, and she's just looking at me with these eyes. And I was like, "But I got nervous and just sort of was like, oh, bye. I should have. If I was, I am." I am a Scorpio. So the moment something presents itself as definite, I immediately assume there's no way it's happening. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was like, oh, no way. Was, she's just she's just being a dick. I'm going to walk away now and just, just pretend scream. like I some beautiful woman didn't just give me a birth control prescription to autograph. That's really funny. Yeah. 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 What were we talking about before? I'm no, I don't remember, but okay. I was just thinking about how he was talking about the arena acts and how it happened in music and possibly happened in a comedy. But if you think, with rare exception, the only bands still that are playing arenas are from the 90s and before. Like, yeah. really no bands from the 2000s. There's a few that get it out, but it used to be in the 90s and previous, if you were a big rock band, you played at an arena. You didn't play in theaters. That was, you know... Those were for the college band, college radio bands played the theaters. Right. If you're on a major label, you played arenas for the most part. And now, man, well, the whole system crumbled. But yeah, I feel like and I also feel like as a performer, I mean, like as a band, I can understand arenas and things like that because it's, you know, you're projecting outward. And there's there's certain things about being in a band I really fucking would love to just experience once. And one of them is the moment where you're just like, okay, you guys are all talking. I don't give a shit. I'm just going to do what I do. We're going to just do us. It's and the just, greatest. Yeah. You know? and, but like, I'm sure that's another thing. Like the subtleties of like knowing as the band, like, oh man, we're, we're bombing right now. Or, or like, oh my God, we're killing right now. But to the layman, it would just be like, I, they're, they're here. What does it matter? But I can understand. I remember the first time I ever witnessed a band quote unquote bomb where I was like, Oh man, that's rough. Was at Lollapalooza in like 1996 ish. So before I even started doing comedy, you remember Lollapalooza? Oh yeah. yeah. So you remember how there was the main stage and then the side stage. Yep. I remember we were all, we were watching on the side stage. There was a band called sponge. I remember right? that. Yeah. And they had like a couple hits and were a good band. And then like middle of their set, Rage Against the Machine was coming on the main stage. And I'm talking just like this mass exodus of people yeah. going to see Rage, us included. And I remember the singer of Sponge just being just not shitting on the audience, but giving them like a it's just the second stage, man. Doesn't mean second tier. You know, it's kind of like it was kind of like a moment like, oh, that does suck because, you know, it's the middle of your fucking set and everyone's running to see rage running to see this and like i said us included but i remember i remember that feeling of witnessing that happen stuck with me I'm yeah but like, he, oh, should, man. he should be so, a little more self-aware to know that as soon as rage against the machine starts i would have been making jokes i would have been like i wish i could come with you guys yes goodbye <laughs> right. Let me know thanks how for it coming is. <laughs> yeah i mean i've seen oh man over the years so many like so many times like the, the I, one of the greatest uh live acts i mean shit dude there's there's been i can't even i can't there's because i've seen some garbage coming through that was what was great growing up in new orleans everyone came through new orleans everyone came through new orleans it was like every band loved it tool tool is probably my favorite band i've ever seen live okay they were great but tool is a band that you get judged a lot for for being a fan of it's kind of like being a rush fan back in the day right right or like when people are like, oh, you're a Dave Matthews band fan. You're like, have you ever seen Dave Matthews live? It's fucking great. It's like, there's a lot going on, but unfortunately he gets a lot of, you know, a lot of new balance wearing khaki boys, you know, yeah. jamming out to it. Uh, and same thing with tool fans. You know, you get, you get a lot of, you get a lot of fucking 
guys who live for the pit, if you know what I mean. Is, is that where the term he's a tool came from? No. I don't. I really thought it did. No, no. I think tool named themselves after that term. Yes. I oh. think their, their initial, yeah, I think their initial thing was like, fuck y'all, we're just going to call ourselves tool. But I talk about Rage Against the Machine. I've seen Rage Against the Machine like five times live. They're hands down one of the great, even if you're not into that sort of music, it's just like, it's fantastic live. Yeah. Oh, it's a great um, band. Uh, but that, that I, the first time I ever saw this is a great moment. In 1999, they're doing the uh, Battle of Los Angeles tour in New Orleans at the UNO Lakefront Arena. You know, it's a 7,000 seater ish. And they're in the middle of the song, Vietnam. And Zach De La Rocha, like, he's like, stop, 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 stop. I need the house lights. I need the house lights. I need the house lights. And all these lights start coming up. You know, it's an arena. Band stops. And then he singles out some guy in the pit. He's like, I've been watching you put your fucking hands on this woman who clearly does not want your fucking hands on her. If you do it again, I will have you thrown out. I will have you thrown the fuck out. And then people start cheering. And then he's going, what? And the guy's talking shit back to him. He's like, he's out. Get him out. And you see, we were up in the stands. You see this dude trying to get out and people sort of like blocking him from getting away. And then security converges on him and they drag the guy out. It's, it's like a 10 minute ordeal, you know, maybe longer. And people are shouting, screaming. They get the guy out. And then the house lights just slowly dim, slowly dim. And then it's jet black in the room. And then it, like from the from the note they left up on, just turn on the radio, like right back into the song and the lights come back up and the music starts again. And it was explosive. It was like, holy shit. Like it, 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 it like looking back, it was like, if that were rehearsed, it was worth it. Right. I don't, yeah. I don't think it was, but like those kind of moments. Oh, gives me what chills. About, just I mean, I meant, will you tell him your, uh, Tommy Lee Motley Crue story? Yes. Oh, yeah, we, we were, uh, there's the municipal auditorium here in town, which is kind of small. And I was, uh, Motley Crue was coming through, and I think Rat was supposed to open for him. And uh, but if our, me and two other guys went, and uh, ended up being Lita Ford. We were pissed that it wasn't Rat. But anyway, <laughs> different story. But anyway, t- it was when Tommy Lee's drum kit would would come a- over the top of the fans, not when it was spinning. It, was, it actually just kind of went out during his drum like solo, a roller coaster yeah. type thing. And yeah. but the municipal auditorium was pretty low, so he came literally right over the top of us, and he had this whole bit he was doing. And we were stoned and we're just sitting up there staring, you know, watching him. And he looks down and he goes, hey, motherfuckers. And we're like, yeah. And we're just sitting there looking. He's like, hey, this ain't no fucking Bon Jovi show. And we're like, yeah. And then we look around and he was talking to us three because we were high. And, we were, and everybody around us was like, ah. and he's like, get your hands in the fucking air. And we're like, yeah, sorry, buddy. But yeah, we got called out by Tommy Lee, literally 10 feet above our heads. And we went back to jamming. He took out his massive penis and, yeah, and just whacked his drum, the fucking <laughs> drum thrown up there, <laughs> unveiled it like a big, huge rope. When you, y'all told me that story, I was like, well, what did you do? And y'all were like, we put, fucking put our hands in the air. Yeah, That's what you do. him and fucking 12,000 other people yelling at us. Yeah. I remember, like, I have a cousin who's my age. Uh, and I remember, like, he, he was our cousin who growing up, like, everyone kind of knew he was gay growing up. He didn't come out till way later. But I remember when we were, like, 18 him and I were in a hotel room on a family vacation watching the Tommy Lee, Pamela Anderson porn, which it was one of those situations where you're in a hotel room and they had the X-rated videos you could order. And we were like, let's just order it. Remember those? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was like, let's just order it. It's going to go on like the thing, the bill. We'll just say it was a regular movie. They won't say what it is. And I remember watching it with him and him just being, but being joking, at the time being like, look how big his cock is. Cause it was, yes. if you remember that. Ford, it bigger it was than Ray J's? I don't, I don't think he's got anything. I don't it. think anything is bigger than Ray. I don't think, <laughs> right. I don't think no. my leg is bigger than Ray J's fucking dingling. Yes, but I, I supposedly Vince Gill said about Porter Wagner is he's like, he oh, saw yeah. it and he said, that thing's so big. It needs an elbow. <laughs> this, <There's>, ah, <laughs> a great and John Ham. John Ham's in that yeah. uh, category. But anyway, oh, sorry, sorry, Tommy yeah. Lee, the other Wait, whole, John Ham. Yeah, apparently he's he's got a mess. He had to get uh, every all of his pants were tailored for his penis. Really? Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, in that, he's got a hand in that club. The hog. <laughs> the hog club. But yeah, the the whole thing about that film was talking about the size of his piece. Yeah. I, I, who do y'all think the? You know, you were talking about Bill Burr and how he was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm just gonna do what I want to do. Who do you think that mu- that musician is? 
Oh, there's a lot of Not them. a band, but like, you know, that's Bill Burr. I mean, we could, I mean, honestly, we could, we could say your grandfather. I mean, he definitely. Okay, but not Papa Willie. Maybe, no, I think. Of course, up, yeah, you're right. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know. Wasn't. Yeah, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis never gave a shit. I mean, I feel, I feel like, uh, like Prince. Uh, uh, yeah. Prince seemed to constantly just be like, what are you, what are you expecting from me? I'm going to defy that. Fuck it. You know, yeah. like he's amazing. Like, you got all the great punk bands like the replacements or black flag, Henry Rollins, yeah, the replacements. You know. but not that's a band. That's true. It's a band. It's a musician. Okay, Iggy, yeah. Iggy pop. How about that? Oh, okay. Iggy, uh, what you, you met, you know, I first learned of Iggy, Iggy pop in the, uh, this is, this is how musically stupid I can be as well. My first like, uh, experience with Iggy pop was the film train spotting. Oh, because they talk about Iggy Pop constantly and Iggy Pop's all over the soundtrack. soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. That was my first like, oh, Iggy. Because I was so stupid. I was like, wait, Iggy Pop's real? Because I thought it was just a character in this movie yeah. or a band in this, you know, a, fake, a fictitious band in this movie. And then it was like, oh, he's real? And then you, you go down that rabbit hole and you're like, Jesus Christ, it's got the realist. You know? <laughs> like, did you see the documentary that Jim Jarmusch did? Jarmusch? There's a, there's no. a, oh, dude, it is. I don't know where it is. You can stream it somewhere, but there is an Iggy Pop documentary that is fantastic. I would, man, I would love to. So like, this is a little bit of name droppery shit, but whatever, like five years ago, through a random convergence of coincidences, I got to hang out with Sean Penn, right? right. Uh, at his, at his house in like Diagon Alley level Malibu, where you have to be a, rich person or be invited by a rich person even see it and you know sean penn extremely nice guy extremely friendly guy you know party animal just love to hang out love to talk shit love to get into it he was very cool and at a certain point in the night he's he's looking at his phone he goes all right everyone tom petty might drop by and i remember all of us and everybody being like okay okay and me just being like whoa okay keep a keep a lid on that and it was Maybe a year before that, I was doing Outside Lands, which is that festival in San Francisco. Right. And I remember Tom Petty and Macklemore were, were performing at the same time on opposite ends of the field. Or of, the, of the field. And I, and I remember me, I wanted to go see Macklemore, but only for like the spectacle of it. I was like, we got to see this fucking idiot, right? I mean, he's not a whatever. He's a some. He's a he's a. I don't know if he's a nice enough guy, and I hate just shitting on him because everybody else does. But at the time, it was like we got to go see that guy. But my girlfriend was like, no, we have to go see Tom Petty. I was yeah. like, fine, we'll go see Tom Petty, and it was mind blowing. It was an amazing fucking performance, and I felt so stupid for almost not going see him. Right. And then it was like two years later at Sean Penn's. He never stopped by. And then a year later, he passed. But I was like, oh, man, like, if he'd have shown up, I don't know if how I would have, I don't know how I would have acted around Tom Petty. Yeah, it'd be interesting because yeah. he's so mellow. He might calm you down, but I'd kind of be the same way. Like, uh, 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 you don't want to say anything dumb and you don't want to, I'd probably just not. I get more nervous around actors than musicians. But even Tom oh, yeah. tells that story about how, you know, speaking of like inferiority comp, not really that, but when they were opening for Bruce Springsteen early on in his career and they were going out to open the show and one of Bruce's roadies pulls him over and he's like, hey, man, when you go out there, if it sounds like they're booing, they're just saying Bruce. And he looks at him and goes, what's the difference? <laughs> Because I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be playing if they're screaming Bruce or boo. It's the same it's thing the to same me. Thing. I'm the opening band. And I was like, what a classic line that was. I have a fun Sean Penn story. Uh, oh, really? Cool. So I was in California with my Aunt Amy, and we were with Papa Willie on the road. On the road. And uh, Sean Penn's there, and he was with Robin Wright Penn at the time. Okay. They were there. Aunt Bobby was there, and there's, we're in this room, and it had um, a pool table so amy and i were playing pool trying to stay away from the famous people which is what we usually do and uh sean penn comes walking over and uh we went we went out to smoke a cigarette and he went to smoke a cigarette he while we're out there he just asked what we do we were saying we write songs and stuff and so when we get back in we're all in there and he goes so why don't you sing a song for us now we're all back in the room with everybody right and amy and i had just written a song for snoop Dogg called who you fucking <laughs> and, 
that was the song that we decided to sing for everyone. And I remember afterwards, it was just crickets. Nobody clapped or anything. It was, it, it was not the right song to, I mean, right. song, anything yeah. else. Uh, she's got a great one. Motherfucker got fucked up. I mean, anything else other than this one song, who you fucking. And then I just remember Papa Willie just looking at us like this after and uh oh, and shit. um and he goes and he goes amy why don't you play turn on that uh the one that folk uke song that you guys do <laughs> just <laughs> so then like amy she's trying to pull it up on her phone uh but oh, yeah it was man. yeah it was really embarrassing so you got to bomb in front of uh yeah sean i bombed Penn. in front of sean Penn and robin wright Penn. there you go once, once you get that out of your system you know what else is there you know you're like hey and yeah. that, I feel like that's it's the same thing with I'm sure with music is, is it like when you bomb you're like you have that one really bad one and you're like fuck it nothing else matters now yeah I can't do anything worse than that probably I've been there been to the bottom yeah been, been to the, there's people always talk about getting to the mountain top there's also getting to the mountain bottom yeah, and we say all the, the 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 best stories come from the bombs not the you know great achievements all the great stories are you're bombing something bad happening. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, w I would not have told you guys that if we had sung, a, sung an amazing song, I, I would have felt stupid being like, oh, one time I performed for Sean Penn and it was fucking great. You know, I would have never told well, you. I pulled, this is funny because I pulled this up. I'll show it to you because you talk about playing music. I don't know how well this is going to translate on camera, but you see oh, yeah. that? Yeah, yep. yeah. So that's Sean Penn with tape on his nose for some reason. Um, that's me with a guitar. I, again, cannot play guitar uh or sing but i was hammered he had told us this story about how he doesn't wear shoes on set like so any any movie you've ever seen sean penn in he's not wearing shoes which is nuts to even oh sorry to even uh think about like and i was like wait really every movie and i'm just like naming off famous movies that he's been in he's like yep unless they're shooting me with shoes on i'm not wearing shoes i just don't like it I'm like, what? So I did a impromptu shitty song on his guitar about how he doesn't, how all the scenes that Sean Penn doesn't wear shoes in. And he, for some reason was like, well, I'm going to put tape on my nose and come up behind. And like, <laughs> it was so weird, but we were all hammered. We were hammered out of our minds. So I kind of bombed in front of him. <laughs> oh, good. We both bombed in front share, of Sean. Hey, share Penn. bombing stories. Share a, a common bond. <laughs> okay. Bombing in front of award-winning actor stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So before we end the podcast, I have to ask you, what is your own personal Papa Willie story? What? When's the first time you remember hearing about him? Did you grow up listening to his music? You don't. That's okay if you didn't. I did. But no, of course, of course. Um, I mean, so I Willie Nelson is ingrained in like you know the especially a city like New Orleans, especially certain parts of the South is sort of ingrained in the musical culture. But I remember I was watching the first time and I saw it in theaters, the movie Half Baked. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that in theaters. I was 19 years old. And I remember, you know, being like, oh, Willie Nelson smokes weed. And <laughs> it's, it's sort of like, well, interesting. Um, and then bringing that up to my parents and my parents laughing hardcore about that being like okay buddy and then going back and listening to like old willie songs and you realize like oh yeah you had to be kind of high out of your mind to think this way at that time you know and also also be you know musically brilliant but like i go back and wish that i would have had a better like i wish i would have had a musical coach that's why I think like if you're an aunt or an uncle or a parent, even like everyone thinks about like, you know, teach your kids the right the, to be the right and wrong and to work hard and to, you know, respect their elders and to, to, you know, strive for to be a doctor or a lawyer, but also like someone teach them about music, you know, like be a musical coach. Cause I did not have that growing up and I really wish I did because I didn't, I did not grow up listening to Willie Nelson. It, it was only later in life, like 19 in my twenties where I went back and started to really appreciate his music. Yeah, you know? it's also uh, harder, it was harder back in the day to even acquire music to listen to. It's not like it was streaming and you got everything all the time. You know, you had to actually pay money to, to listen to music, certain things other than just the radio. So 
Well, I also just find it. I'm very, I'm very inspired by the story of like, you know, him uh, trying to break into the, country, the classic country music world and them just being like, you, you don't got what it takes. And he's like, fuck you. I, I'll just do it myself. Then I'll just do my own thing. Yeah. And now he's a legend. And now his, that style is legendary. And now like, you know, I, for some people, you, you, I've met people who you'd argue is Willie Nelson country, you know, because he crossed oh, yeah. over in a way, you know what I mean? And like, and you think about that, 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 you know, this, this, this look, I mean, this, this board behind you with the hat and the, the whiskey. Oh, that's no board. That's him. He's just being yeah, very he's quiet. <laughs> being a good grandpa. If he moved, I'd fucking. Yeah, that would have been hysterical. What are you? Yeah. But like, I think of the classic, like, like over the quarantine, I was initially, I was wearing, I was wearing a bandana because my hair was a lot longer. I was wearing it around my head and I was calling it my Willie Nelson face. Yeah. You know, not, like, not around your mouth. You didn't wear the no, I was. I had a regular mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I don't know. There's just, I, I've always been very inspired by that story of like, if you, yeah. he encapsulates, like if you believe in you, just mm -hmm. do you. Yeah. And, Yes, yeah. there's going to be a ton of fucking haters along the way. And there's going to be so many people who doubt you. And that's part of it. And just pay no mind to it. Stay you. Yeah. And I, that I love. Yeah, that a great spot to end. Yeah, on. yeah, exactly. It's beautiful. Sean, thank you so much for doing this with us. Yeah, man. Next time you come through Nashville, let us know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this has been cool as shit. Great to just wrap with y'all. Thank you so much for having me. We'll go to Santa's and sing next time you're in town. I would, <laughs> I would <laughs> love watch, watch me just butcher any song you choose. I will butcher it. You know, on the way out, I'm I just going to suggest that they should come up with a karaoke for uh, comedy. And you just go up there and read the bits off and try to do comedy bits. I think I just can't. Oh my God. Idea. That's what I want to do. And, and, and you'd see how many people just can't do it. Uh, because uh, exactly. It's like, like karaoke. <laughs> for, uh, karaoke of for comedy. Yeah. And you could like dial up Mitch Hedberg and you try it. We should start that. You know how Josh Adam Meyer says the goddamn comedy jam. We goddamn comedy jam. start that here. We could be like karaoke comedy. Jelly. Jam. Jelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. There it is. Anyway. Thanks, Sean. It's good to meet you, bro. Thank, thank y'all. Y'all have a good one. You too. Bye. Sean Patton is my favorite comedian. Enjoy your groceries. Don't be an asshole. I know your mama's name. Did we free Britney yet?